page. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, today is December 10th, uh, 2022, and this is the uh, World Citizen uh, Virtual Book Club uh, put on by CGS. Um, for those of you who I have not met, um, my name is Bob Flax and I'm the executive director. Um, I have a couple of brief announcements before we uh, move into the, the book itself. Um, first of all, uh, our guest presenter, Tiz Dr. Tiziana Stella, uh, may or may not be joining us today. Um, she is en, en route to Italy or about to leave and uh, has a lot of preparations to do. Uh, so she said she will try to be here at some point. Uh, so just to let you know, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed without her at the beginning and um, she may show up. Um, we also have one session left next month. And, um, and that session, you know, will be the last in this book. So just to let you know, to make sure, you know, it, it's certainly been um, a benefit to have the author here or presenter here. And sometimes they're hard to get. I mean, over the last yeah. few years, we've gotten people that we know that are kind of in our inner circle. So we have now been reaching out in advance uh, to get people and kind of book them out for the next year. So we actually had uh, two different um, people. Actually, one is a, a, a well, let me, let me back up and say, so we've been doing that. We also realize that we've been going very heavily on the historical books. Um, so what we want to do is strike a balance. So we have started planning in terms of having one book addressing our history, and then the next book, uh, a more contemporary one about World Federation, global governance, et cetera. So since the last couple of books um, have been more historic, including the one we're, we're reading now, Union Now, um, we have tried to get a contemporary one next, and we have a um, hot off the presses book um, that we'll be starting with in, um, in wait a second, um, yes, in February. Um, and the title of that, if you want to rush out and get it uh, in, you know, way in advance, the title of that is Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. I'll say that again, it's a mouthful. Global yeah. governance and the emergence of global institutions for the 21st century. And there are three authors with that. Um, so what, we, um, what we've arranged with them is they will be taking turns. Uh, most likely they'll be coming one at a time. In some cases, more than one will come. So whoever has the expertise or, or the, the greatest expertise in the, in the chapters we're covering will be the presenter for that. So this will be the first time we're doing a co-authored book um, with three authors. So that will go from February to June, and then we'll take July off. And then in August, we have the next book up, um, which is called The Peacemakers, uh, colon, subtitle, India and the Quest for One World. Again, the title is The Peacemakers, India and the Quest for One World. And it's also, uh, it's a recent book, but about the movement's history uh, by a historian, um, I forgot what university he's at, uh, uh, Dr. Manu uh, Bhagavan, who I heard present some years ago, right after he wrote the book. And basically it's about, I, I think some people know that th th there've been you know, quotes from Gandhi and Nehru about um, World Federation. So the book is about Gandhi, Nehru and Nehru's sister. And the three of them, um, which I didn't know before I heard this talk, were really a powerhouse in India pushing for a world federal government. Um, and you may or may not know that there are, I'm forgetting the number, maybe Ron, you might know, there are a, a number of countries around the world that actually have world federation in their constitution. It, it mm. says in one form or another that we're for it, or if one gets formed, we will join it. And in India, I know that's Article 51 in the Indian Constitution. Um, so anyhow, so he will be, uh, Manu Bhagavan will be presenting uh, on that, on the, uh, the work of Gandhi, Nehru, and Nehru's sister. Um, so we have our next year lined up. Um, 
And apparently, uh, Dave, I'll get you in a second. And apparently, as we reached out, just to let you know, um, the presenters already heard about our book club and said that they were happy that we reached out to them. Um, so word, word, word is spreading. So any questions, comments about that? Dave, I saw you had your hand up. The first one is global governance and the emergence of what? Yeah, the emergence, uh, that's a good question. The emergence of what? The emergence of global institutions for the 21st century. Global governance and the emergence of global institutions. It's in the chat. Yamali oh, put great. it in the chat. Oh, terrific. Great. I was I didn't have the chat open. That's always good to do. So, uh, oh, terrific. Okay, it's in there. Thank you. And the uh, the second one, as I said, is um, oh wait a minute. It's um, okay. Yeah, the peacemakers: colon India and the quest for one world. So we've got our we've got our curriculum uh, set up for the next year. David. Yeah. So Manu Bhagavan was at the Week of World Parliament event uh, oh, yes. where I also presented uh, in New York. So he mm -hmm. was a wonderful speaker. The students had a lot of questions. He he went on probably maybe 45 minutes, even more than, than was allotted. So he will be great to speak. And I was actually on a, after Gary Davis died, I was on a HuffPost Live when they had a TV show uh, event talking about Gary Davis. And Manu Bhagavan was one of the uh, experts <laughs> that they asked about world citizenship. And of course, uh, Gary spent a lot of time in India, which uh, uh, Professor Bhagavan you know, knew about. I'm not sure if the book mentions that, but I think it's an interesting connection. I'm glad we're gonna be reading that. Thank you. That's great. So you have an unsolicited endorsement right there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this was not rehearsed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I found him a, a wonderful presenter as well. Um, so that's good. So, um, so those are all of my announcements. Any questions about that? Fabulous. Um, so just uh, before we go into the content, just uh, our basic reminders is one is please remain on mute when you're not speaking. So again, we don't hear the, the kids running around in the background or the, the phones ringing and the, you know, the machines going off and all that stuff. Um, second, when we do do discussion, if you would please raise your cyber hand, if you know how to do that, I, I will call on those first because it puts it in order. Uh, so that's the, the fairest way. And then when I get through that, if there are still people who have who ha did not know how to do it or can't find the function, uh, just raise your flesh hand. And rather than do it to the side where I can't see it, you got to do it in front of the camera. Uh, so that will let me um, know that you've raised your hand. Um, and last but not least, we'll stop about five to 10 minutes before uh, to, in case anyone here has any announcements about anything they're promoting or an event they're doing or something like that. So if you do have something to promote, please hold it till the end rather than in the middle of the discussion. Um, and we'll also uh, verify the next date, um, which will, again, will be the last one for this book. Um, so Gail, anything, um, any loose ends that I left out that you know of? Um, no, except I see that Annie Sweetenham has joined us. Uh, I, I've been having a bit of trouble with my computer. So I was a couple of minutes late and I, I, I was sent her the, um, the link to get in. So I see it was successful. Terrific. Well, welcome. And this is your first time in, in the, uh, to a session, correct? I'm just okay. unmuting myself. Yes, this is my first time. I'm right. very well, happy well, to be here. Terrific. Well, welcome, and you're free to you. jump in like everyone else. Okay. Okay. So, any uh, any other um, logistics or business that anyone has before we dive into the book? Okie dokie. So, uh, without any further ado, um, so um, again, we, th this for this session, um, we were looking at chapters seven, eight, and nine of Union Now. Um, and I want to open it up um, first on chapter seven. If anyone has any comments, if anything stuck out for anyone, uh, anything you disagreed with in, in reading that. And, um, and I have something, you know, I have a comment that no one else does, but, uh, uh, but anything um, there that anyone wanted to raise? Going once, going twice. Yes, Gail, and you're on mute. Um, 
I, I noted that, you know, it said that, um, you know, this union should go ahead despite the fact that there are um, um, demo, undemocratic um, components or something or something, but it said that the U.S. became a, when the U.S. became um, a federation, it included non-democratic states like the slaveholding states. Hmm. So, I mean, that seemed to contradict what he was saying before that well, no, you have to start with just the democracies. So that confused me a bit. I, bit I, I wasn't sure what he was getting at there. Okay. Anyone have any thoughts about that? Did that catch your eye when you were reading it as well, David? Well, those states were democratic for white citizens. It was just for slaves that it was non-democratic. Yeah, and women, and women. <laughs> And non-property holding men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, and, and this is um, not anything that Streit said, but this is going back to something that Joseph Barada brought up when we talked about the, the meaning of the word democracy and how it was used in the past. And, and, and what he said um, was that, you know, when we, when we look at past standards, um, that democracy was basically, that word was used when there was an elected legislature. Um, period. Um, and, and over time, you know, more things, I mean, our contemporary view, in, you know, includes, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, you know, I mean, a, a whole bunch of things. Um, and of course, universal suffrage, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, th th so that's, that's my interpretation of, of how he's dealing with that, that th those, all of the 13, you know, former colonies now independent nations essentially um, um, during that time had elected legislatures uh, or were in the process of implementing that or whatever. So that's, that, that's my understanding. Gail? But um, you know, he seemed to say that if we incorporated uh, non-democracies, then it wouldn't work. But the democratic states that had non-democratic components worked. So why wouldn't it work to include countries that weren't democracies in this World Federation? Okay, good question. Anyone want to speak to that? Well, things are always changing. <laughs> so things can evolve over a very short period of time sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I think the the non, I mean, I can't second guess what Streit was thinking at the time. Well, let me get Donna in. I saw her hand uh, came up as I started yeah, talking. I, I thought his point was just to get the democracies together to get it started as a group. Not that it would or wouldn't work, but just, but if this was just some way to create a group of nations agreeing to federate and um, and that was just coming up with a definition of how to do it. So it, it's not, it, I don't think there, it, it, my understanding anyway of what I understand Dr. Stella saying, because um, I have to confess, I haven't read the book. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, that was it, that it was just a, a group to bring together who might agree to federate. And that was just a definition of that group. So, I mean, the idea could be carried forward other ways too, you know, just agree on some group to get started maybe. Anyway, that's my understanding. Great, thank you. Any other comments first on, on that point? Okay, well then I'll take um, hands. If anything else jumped out at you in chapter seven, I'll put myself in the queue if no one else. Okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll call on myself. Um, to me, I, I have to say, to me, this book has been an eye opener in, in many ways. And, and chapter seven um, was mentally kind of a, a blockbuster for me that it basically, you know, what, what the point, my, my takeaway from the point of that chapter is, yes, it's true that if nations federate, 
the nations as they lose a bit of sovereignty, lose a bit of power. So he says, yes, that's true. However, most people have a misconception and most people think by that, they think, well, if, they, if their nation loss loses power, they lose power too, individually. But, but Strike kind of turns that on his head. He says, oh, no, 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 that's not the case at all. That when the nation, when your own nation is losing power, you individually are gaining power. And then he gives two kinds of arguments. Um, one kind of mathematical, where he crunches numbers and shows why and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll leave figuring that out to people like Donna, who's a mathematician. I read that late at night. I had a hard time wrapping my head around it, but I'll, I'll go back. But then he also gave other kind of analogies and metaphors. You know, he said, basically, you know, you're never losing rights to begin with because you, you're taking your right and either investing in, in, in your nation, you know, or you're investing it in the federation at the higher level. So you never lose rights, he says, first of all. But he says it's it's as you know silly to say we're sacrificing by going into a federation because if you take your money, this is one of his metaphors. You take your money from your house and you put it in a bank, you know, uh, in a safe deposit box. You're not sacrificing your money. You're protecting it by putting it in a place that's more powerful. And he goes through di different arguments about how you're actually you know you're getting greater protections. Um, by federating. And then he goes on and on with other analogies and things. And it was, I, I just, I mean, I had never even thought of any of those things, nor have I heard other people talking about them. Um, not saying that they don't, it just, it, those are not the arguments that I've heard in the years I've been involved. So to me, you know, I got very excited when I read that chapter and, um, and really kind of want to master the arguments because when I talk to other people, they have that same misconception that, oh, well, I'm going to lose rights if we go, go in. And it's like, no, 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 you're going to gain rights. So I, I thought that was a mind blower for me personally. So I see some hands. Uh, David, you're first, then I see Gail. Yeah, so um, I, I agree with you. I, I love this book club because it really uh, reaffirms the work that we're, well, the organ that CGS is doing, but also my day-to-day -day job as a human rights lawyer uh, and being able to explain what is World Federation, what is World Citizenship, but in particular to this chapter and maybe even the few chapters that followed, um, I really appreciated how Strite uh, focused on the individual. And I think that also reaffirms uh, what we learned from Ron Glossop's book, thank you, Ron, about World Federation being a, uh, and the laws uh, and the, you know, a world parliament or whatever, always uh, going back to the individual and the rights of the individual um, rather than the, the state having rights. Because I, uh, one thing Gary Davis would always say to me is states or nation states don't have rights, they only have powers. And if you read every national constitution, it talks about the people as having rights and the, the government or the state having powers. And that in the end, really the government is there for us to be of, by, and for the people. So I, I really, I keep seeing these um, synergies between all the different books that we're reading uh, where World Federation refers back to us as, as individuals. And we are really the, should be the highest um, goal of protection of, of us as individuals uh, in a, you know, once we have a fully functioning World Federation. And so, I mean, it, it makes sense how he talks about union versus league uh, in, in that way, and that union supports individuals where leagues support just states. Thank you. Uh, Gail and then David. Gail, you're still on mute. I also was struck by that particular um, example that he gave. I thought that was very powerful. I mean, it's, nations would not join the union if they didn't, if they weren't convinced they would gain more than they would lose. However, um, as long as the membership is by states, it could be, I mean, you're saying that the individuals in the state would gain even more, but if the state thinks that it's, it's losing, then it might want to withdraw. I'm thinking here of Brexit, because membership isn't by individuals, but by states. So I'm wondering about that. 
Um, great. Let me get David in. And if you want to speak to that as well, then I'll jump in. Uh, for me, the important points of this chapter were in the the um, headlines of each of the sections, why leagues cannot enforce law and why unions can enforce law. And he makes a, a very uh, sharp distinction, just as Ron does in his book, between confederations and, and federations. Um, so this book was written during the time of the League of Nations, uh, before the United Nations, but even the United Nations in the General Assembly only can pass uh, non-binding resolutions of how nations should act, uh, but doesn't apply that to individuals and, and lawbreakers. So I think that that was an important point that he makes in this chapter. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just swing back to um, the question Gail raised about what about Brexit or things like that. And my understanding is that the, the, the reason Brexits can happen is the European Union is not yet a federation. It's somewhere in between individual states and, and a federation. They do have a parliament, they do have various things, but it's not yet a federation, which is why you can still pull out um, once it's a federation. You know, and this was the whole thing the Civil War, our Civil War was about. You know, we were a federation, and can you pull out of that? Um, and I guess it's the victors who uh, write the history and make the rules. <laughs> so the, the rules showed you can. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's my comment on that. Anybody else on this chapter? Going once, going twice? Okay, terrific. So now for all of those who haven't read it, I'm sure you're excited to go and read it after, after the, wait, wait, the breakthroughs we said that are in that. Okay, so the, uh, the next chapter um, was on the benefits of World Federation. Um, there were five of them that they listed. Um, and I just wanna throw it open, or at least I saw five. Um, I wanna throw it open if, if anything, again, leaped out at you that maybe you found surprising or didn't know, or that you disagree with, or anything of that sort. So any comments on chapter eight? Okay, seeing no hands, I'll just list them, uh, uh, understanding that some people have busy lives and may not have been able to read the chapter. Um, so, so the first was the uh, military disarmament and security. Um, which, you know, historically is what gave birth to our movement. So I think most people are probably familiar with that. A second was what he called economic disarmament, which was an interesting way to phrase it, economic disarmament. A third was um, kind of related to that, um, monetary stabilization. Again, monetary stabilization. I see some of you making notes, so I'll say it twice. Um, the next one was communication. And the fifth one, um, he listed as men, comma, jobs, comma, taxes, and government. And I'm sure now that men would be replaced by people. Um, yeah. But at the time, it was men, jobs, taxes, and government. So those were the five uh, labels for the benefits. Um, any comments, thoughts, questions about his arguments? or disagreements? Yes, uh, uh, David, go ahead. Well, again, I think we just have to keep in mind that this was written before World War II. So he's listing then the advantages of a union that could have prevented a second world war. Yeah. Yeah, and that seemed to be his overriding um, motivation, you know, to do this so we can, so Hitler would not dare attack something so great. I mean, basically. Other, uh, Gail. Yeah, my concern is that, um, you know, if the military is strong enough, it can prevent others, you know, the states from withdrawing who might otherwise want to withdraw because the other um, the other components are not effective. I mean, straight does say it has to be effective to work. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's just the military that really prevents 
states from withdrawing. That's a tyranny, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. So um, now in our federation in the US, it's successful in that the states really don't want to withdraw. Well, except for Texas and, you know, a few. <laughs> <laughs> Northern but, California also. That's a weird, right. hippie, weird right wing hippies up there. Right. So that would be, you know, what would really make it a success. But mm. anyway, that I'm always worried about the tyranny thing. So that's something that came to my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be a good question to ask Tiziana, whether she makes it here today or in the last session, um, if she knew anything more about Streit's thinking on that. Um, you know, I mean, because obviously, I mean, what he says is very straightforward that, you know, if they're successful, if the Federation is successful, the nations won't want to leave. Um, but what if one does, you know, and because they, in their judgment, they're not, they're not, you know, they're, they're falling backwards um out of it i mean that you know did, did stride have anything to say about that that would be a a good tiziana question so uh david yes yeah, so uh, and i can't totally i was looking i'm looking back in my book to see but i don't totally see it so it may have been either in the previous chapter or the next one but i think he talks about the benefits of union as reducing waste almost like uh, not having to have an embassy in every uh, in every country um, from your country. I mean, it, just like there's no embassy in Indiana for Illinois or whatever, right? It's uh, we're saving a, a lot of uh, funds and, and um, repetition of uh, departments or other things by having a union rather than um, you know rather than being having our own separate you know science departments and. And all. So I, I really think for me, that was extremely compelling. I mean, it's an argument that I use about world citizenship that that, you know, we, we wouldn't have to necessarily have a passport. We might have some form of ID, but you should be able to go for, to Beijing or to you know Moscow or to Agadugu, just like you go to um, New York City or whatever, if you're if you're living in New Jersey. So I, I, that that for me. The, the savings you might say and the la the lack of uh, harm to the environment by not having all these extra either military or resources <laughs> being wasted it was really compelling to me right thank you uh donna um i'll understand if nobody if you don't want to answer this but could somebody explain what economic disarmament means i find that term interesting and i uh, wish i had read it <laughs> <laughs> but if okay. everybody else already knows, you don't have to answer just for me. All right. Well, it seems like there may be a few people that haven't read the chapter, so uh, it would be helpful to to bring that out. Uh, David, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I think it's in terms of trade barriers. It would be open trade with a union. Uh, they wouldn't need tariffs, for example. That's what he's talking about. Uh, yeah. Let let me Go also ahead. mention as uh, to piggyback on what David Gallup said, not only would nations not need embassies to other nations, but they wouldn't need spies. Mm. Therefore, you wouldn't need a CIA. There's no reason to spy on other, other countries uh, if you had a, an effective uh, World Federation. Cool. And I'll, I'll I'll jump in to loop back to the um, the economic disarmament that I don't know I don't remember that Street mentions this he probably doesn't but economic sanctions I mean when we don't yet go to war but want to punish another country you know imposing all those sanctions so that I I would imagine um, you know that's that's an economic war so not having to do that would be economic disarmament also. Anything else on the benefits? Going once, going twice. Okay, we're, we're having a fast track book club today. Um, okay, the um, the last chapter, um, if you can call it a chapter, was only about three or four pages. Um, and he, in, to, in my reading, he made a single point uh, in that kind of a summary statement. Um, does anyone want to speak to that? What was your takeaway from that? David. 
Well, so um, you're talking about chapter nine, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I found it interesting from, I studied history in college and we talked about the body politic, mm. right? And relating um, what a government does as, as, as it relates to a human body. And I, and, and that, you know, I, I found that interesting that he's talking about injecting like a serum or, or a COVID vaccine, you know, union into the body politic. Uh, so I don't know whether, I mean, this would be, I would, I would love to have Tiziana here to, to ask, um, but was that because he was trying to add some kind of scientific basis to his argument for union? Um, or was it just that, that historically so many, at least the white men historians have used the, the idea of body politic as, as, um, as an explanation uh, to people of what uh, a government is meant to be? I mean, you know, if you don't have a brain, what your arms might be flailing and doing other things if it, if, if it can't control the body. And this is what uh, I think he was trying to, to get at is that the union is the, is the antidote to, to the um, things that are infecting society, I guess. I don't know if anyone has an answer to that, that question, I guess. I, um, I, well, one David doesn't, but the other David does. <laughs> Good, so, thank you. <laughs> let's go. Let's, well, I think throughout the book, he's going from two. So he's going from the league to unions with the democracies. And in this chapter, he's going from nationalism to unionism. And on the individual level, it's what we would call the difference between uh, patriotism and humatriotism of national citizenship to world citizenship. Cool. I'll throw myself in the queue. Um, I, I must admit, I skimmed that one very quickly. Um, so I have a takeaway, but I'm not sure if it's one I made up or whether it was actually in, in the reading of it. But but my takeaway, you know, he, he first of all, the, the, the name, you know, the name of the chapter. Let me just look at it again. Exactly. Um, is isolation of the germ. And then he talks about injecting the virus of absolute nationalism into a system. So I think he said, this may be my, my projection, I think he said, if you take something like the United States and inject absolute nationalism into each of the individual states, then what happens? You know, each state has to have an army. Each state has to, you know, do all these things now to protect itself from the others because they're better than all the others. That's, that's that absolute nationalism thing. So, um, so my takeaway was, you know, that's kind of like a poison, you know, and uh, he refers to it as a virus, um, that once you put that into a system, it infects the system and you get all these horrible outcomes. Um, so, um, so again, maybe I made that up, but that, that's, that was what I, the impression I got from that chapter. David? Um, again, I, I find it so interesting that this was written in the 1930s compared with what we've just gone through, the whole Trumpism mm. of America first, uh, mm. which shows the exact opposite of uh, how to benefit the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, you could say um, that it was, you know, the, the last administration injected it on the national level. Uh, rather than into individual states, and we see what happened. Yeah, yeah. His book, I mean, is just an enormously predictive. You know, I mean, uh, you know, foreshadowing so much that has happened since. It's amazing. Uh, okay, back to the other David. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Um, I mean, this may be widening the conversation before we're ready. I don't know, Bob. You can say, David, be quiet. Uh, but, but. I kind of feel like reading this makes me feel like, well, this is exactly what we're living through right now with the United Nations. And that look, you know, look how uh, countries, uh, whether it's, you know, Russia invading Ukraine or the, the war in Ethiopia or ongoing wars in Yemen, Syria, wherever, uh, the UN has no power to stop that. It's, 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 not, uh, it's not even a confederation. It really is still like a league. Um, and I just wonder about the idea of trying to, you know, still reform the United Nations, you know, on our, in our theory of change, um, you know, I, I wonder what Strite would say about, you know, could could the League have ever been reformed? 
you know, into, into a, a federation or do we need to do something else? I kind of feel like he was saying, you know, we need to move from that and, and do something completely different and, and develop that union. I mean, it's just a question for all the, all of us who are working in this field, whether it's, you know, CGS, the World Federa you know, World Federalist Movement, Democracy Without Borders. I mean, do we attack the germ, you know, the, that's even in the, the UN system or, or, you know, or, and, or do we do something else? I mean, that's, yeah. Great. Yeah. And, and, and kind of David is foreshadowing the next thing that I wanted to do, which was open it up to broader discussion once we have, um, you know, if, if we've exhausted all the questions and comments about those three chapters. So, so let me see first, is there anything that anyone else wanted to bring up about the three chapters um, and or any of the implications thereof? And then I'll just, we have plenty of time. So then I'll just toss it open for more general save the world conversation. Yes, David, the other day, back to the other David. Uh, let me put Ron Gloss up on, on the spot. Um, Ron, <laughs> did you have this book in mind in writing your book when you talked about uh, how the problem of only federating the democracies is the possibility of the non-democratic countries also having a, 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 their own federation? And then you continue to have conflict between federations. I don't remember. But that's certainly a relevant point, that one of the things you need to worry about is if you get one group of countries joining together, then the other countries can join together with a different kind of confederation. Yeah. That's something that can always happen. Yeah. And going back to a point that Joseph Barada made when we went through his book, um, I think, if I remember correctly, what he said is, you know, way back when, when the World Federalist Movement started, um, this conversation was a big one. And they were talking about, you know, to use Joseph's words, whether a World Federation has to be universalist, you know, ver like the UN, you know, versus some smaller subgroup, whether it's the democracies or anything. And again, if I remember correctly, um, David said, uh, not David, um, too many Davids. Uh, Joseph said that, the, no, never too many Davids. Uh, Joseph said that the universalists basically won the argument and that, and that, that was kind of the thrust of things. Um, and certainly now what we're seeing in the global political situation, you know, is nations, you know, that are not part of the kind of liberal democracies uh, are aligning more to kind of make their own internet, make their own currency, you know, their, their own economic block and stuff. So in a way we, we are on, you know, we, or we, we could continue going in that direction of the two biggies. And I remember um, for those of you here who have a more religious bent, I remember in the Old Testament, um, they're supposed to be, I may be pronouncing, mispronouncing the Hebrew, uh, but the great war of Gog and Magog. Uh, which was the apocalypse, or it le either led to the apocalypse or somewhere in there. Um, and some people, you know, through Nostradamus's writing, you know, have speculated over the years, oh, that's Russia versus the U.S., and now it's Russia and China. So yeah, so so that's a, I guess I'm I'm going off on a tangent there, but that is a very real question. I mean, the democracies seem expedient if we want to move quickly, and both Tiziana's organization. And another one, the one in Australia, um, Chris Hamer at the lead, are looking to push the, you know, the democracies as the nucleus out of strikes thinking versus the possible catastrophe that could happen out of that, a new Cold War with a different set of players. So anyway, so yeah. So uh, Gail, I, I bet you want to talk about that point. <laughs> You're still on mute though. Yeah. Um, oh, I froze. Yeah, I think Strait would say that um, if the democracies were to unite, they would have overwhelming um, force in, com in comparison with even a unified um, other nations um, to deter them. But of course, at the time he wrote, the world was different. So um, Russia and China, for example, weren't nearly as powerful then as they are now. So I'm not sure that 
that would be the same now as when he wrote it. Yeah. So it could be more of an issue now, it seems to me. Good point. And even if it is still true now, it may not be true in 10 years. You know, I mean, we're in a rapidly changing environment now. I'm sorry, Ron, you were beginning to say something. No, I, oh, I, no, I just wanted to agree with that point. No. And I think it is, a, the, the, the situation is that things change within nations. I mean, there's been a huge change in Russia. Think about Gorbachev. Um, th th things happen within countries. Hopefully, something's going to happen within China. But, you know, things do happen within countries. And that means that the international situation changes from time to time as different nations follow different paths. And, and just to piggyback on that, I mean, you know, over the last few years, we've certainly seen um, you know, what people have called the erosion of democracy in many nations. But in the last month or two, you know, as a rebellion to China's COVID policy or rebellion to Russia's invasion, um, we've seen pushback that would not have been expected only a few months ago. So uh, just to- Well, when to Gorbachev was changing things, yep. it made a big difference what this country did and didn't mm. do did not work with Gorbachev, but re, uh, the Republicans were in control and tried to make it look like this is a matter of capitalism versus socialism and has nothing to do with politics. Yeah. Okay. Bob, Any... you can add Iran to that list also. Oh, yeah. yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, right now, I mean, today. <laughs> it's... Yeah. This is very contemporary. Um, so anything else, uh, whether it be the chapters or spinning out of it or any other things has grabbed you in World Federation news around the world? That's what we might have our first in history ending early, um, but okay. But to prevent us from ending early, I see Gail and David. So go ahead, Gail. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I, I'm... Let's see, I'm, now I've, I've lost my thought. But go ahead with David. Oh, he'll come to me. Okay, we'll get you back in. Uh, <laughs> David. Yeah, so I, I actually thought we were supposed to read through chapter 10, <laughs> but maybe I was wrong. Was it seven through nine? Uh, it was seven through nine, but if you have something that's stuck out about 10, you could uh, get us all excited about it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, he, uh, just the stripe talked about, you know, what, what rights a, a union would uh, ensure, you know, which pretty much every government ensures, and it, it says the, the right to grant citizenship, the right to make peace and war, the right to regulate interstate and foreign trade, the right to coin and issue money, and the right to govern communications. So uh, it was really interesting, especially after having, you know, had um, uh, Glenn Martin on talking about the, the world, con you know, World Constitution and Parliament Association and the Earth Constitution that really uh, this chapter, which, you know, once again, for, for us as book club uh, members, uh, it's interesting that he's talking about, create, you know, developing a, a, an earth or a world constitution and what would need to be in it. And, he, at the, and in the appendix of the book, he actually provides a sort of a draft short, short con constitution. So I, I would love to ask Glenn Martin, though, if, you know, uh, if, if um, Philip Isley and the, the people who were drafting the earth constitution, whether they looked at what Strife had done as, as just an initial impetus. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, th this and what other potential earth uh, or world constitutions uh, uh, may have been uh, created prior to the Glenn Martin's. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I will say briefly, Glenn points out in one of his books that there have been over 200 constitutions written for the earth, um, which I had no idea. Uh, but, you know, most uh, most of them did not gain any traction, but the ones we're aware of are the ones that did. So I see Gail, Carla and and Lee's hand as well. So, Gail, you remembered what you were saying. Yes, I yeah. did. I was thinking back of what I was saying about how the undemocratic members within mm -hmm. a democratic world federation, you know, the problem with that, that happened, of course, in the U.S., 
with the undemocratic states, namely the slave states, launching, you know, they, there was a civil war. So if they, I mean, there were, potentially they could have won and disintegrated the Federation. So that would always be a threat, it, it would seem to me. Uh, but it depends on whether the democratic elements will maintain um, sufficient strength to quash any uprisings by undemocratic forces. And could it ever be the reverse? Is of course, you know, a problem, a mm. possible problem. Right. Good. Thank you. Uh, column A, and then Lee. Uh, I I really want to um, just piggyback on what Gail was was doing. That's what my intent was. That whole the the the, the thesis of this book, to begin with the democratic nations, and at least begin there. It, that has, for me, that fatal flaw, and that is that that other component could develop, and there would be civil strife between the the two elements and the two worldviews. Whereas, if in the other literature we've been reading, it is that we form, uh, we we go across the globe, and we we begin universally. The reason I, I lean in that direction and I'm worried about exactly what Gail brought up is the fact that by numbers and by uh, by effect, by by what it what it shows uh, turns out, the other nations that would be reticent would be brought in by what we should say political correctness. They, they would be brought in by persuasion and by the fact that this is working and we're not. This is far better than conflict. So that's just my conclusions, you know, as we read this literature and see the different approaches to World Federation. Right. Thank you. Uh, Lee. Well, I, I skipped around in the reading because I didn't have time to read the whole thing. So I'm not sure where this came from, but I got the idea uh, that at some point he proposed, the author proposed that um, if we had a leader from one country who was willing to propose a get together of the democratic nations to start such a union, um, then I speculated, well, okay, suppose Biden uh, decided not to run again. And so he felt he had nothing to lose. And um, he got this idea from somebody that um, this would be a, a good way to go. And, and so he put out a proposal that two years from now, uh, the, there be a, a meeting of conference of the democratic countries in order to begin forming a union. What do you think would be the result of that? Would it be worth doing or not? Okay, so I'll put that question out to anyone who wants to respond to it. Um, and uh, Lynn. I just wanted to bring up the, um, when she was, Carla May, I think you were talking about the power of persuasion and that's come up to me a lot in policing and community policing versus, you know, the, the big uproar against policing and getting rid of police entirely. And I think that's where a lot of that, if that kind of, from that kind of perspective, I think persuasion would work really well for policing. And it's, it's a model for how larger systems operate federations and world governments. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll take a stab at answering Lee's question. Um, I, I mean, and it's that uh, I share Gail and Carla May's concern about uniting the democracies, creating a bigger problem than the one we currently have in our world. <laughs> um, and 
and that if we unite the democracies, we're just creating a bigger wedge between the, those the democratic nations and non-democratic nations. Now, the, the tricky thing, though, for me is that I agree. I mean, even our mission statement says we want a democratic world federation, Citizens for Global Solutions mission statement. We want a democratic world federation. So I, I know like when I go out and talk to people about this idea, I usually, you know, say that that um, at minimum what we want it, the nations to agree to is to let their people elect the representatives to the parliamentary assembly that that part has to be democratic. And um, I know there are some who say, well, you know, what makes you think Putin will let his people elect, um, or even if he does, that it would, maybe it won't be fair or just or something. But but um, I don't know, just the way our nation started with uh, the horrors of slavery. I mean, I guess if we can expect there'll be other horrors we have to expect as we try to move the world forward. Um, anyway, so I, I, um, I, I, I really worry about about uniting democracies and creating a bigger problem than the world than the one we currently face. And um, like to, but I do want a democratic world federation, and I want the people of the world to elect their representatives, even if their nations aren't democratic at the national level. Thank you. I got me and then David um, in line. So I have two comments kind of off of things that were said earlier. Um, one is the, um, uh, as far as the, the, the issue that Gail originally raised and uh, other people brought up, it sounds like there were two different issues that I just want to make a distinction between. One is the, um, like in the, in the US situation, coming together as a federation where the members had non-democratic parts, you know, like slavery, for example. And again, we could argue that even the states in the North, which didn't allow women to vote, did, may not even allow non-property holders to vote, one could argue none of them were democratic, um, except that they had elected legislatures. So maybe they, they reached that low bar. So, so there's the issue of the internal non-democratic problems uh, you can please mute your phone if you're not, because we're hearing noise of things moving and all. Thank you. Um, so there's that issue versus the issue of the democratic nations uniting then uh, versus another group of non-democratic nations uniting. So that, that it's, a, it's a different issue with, uh, with whole, there may be some overlapping problems, but there certainly are different problems uh, as well. So I just wanted to make that distinction so it could be clear that they're not the same thing. Um, the other thing is staying on the same topic is I know, and I don't remember, maybe someone remembers that Streit had a, um, a response to this issue um, that, that, you know, about the de democracies coming together and then opposing the non-democracies or the non-democracies opposing them and getting us into global hot water. Um, so he had a response to that. And at the moment, I, I'm just not remembering it. So if anyone does, I invite them to speak up um, because he, he had a reasoned argument why that is unlikely uh, to happen. So anyway, those are my two points. Thank you, David. Uh, you, do you still have your hand up? All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in response to what you just asked, uh, Bob, I think Streit's uh response was that the democracies united would be so much stronger than the non-democracies in uh, resources, militarily, in every way that uh, it wouldn't, the non-democracies couldn't challenge them. Mm -hmm. I think that was his response. And then um, to Lee's uh, thought about, you know, Biden or some other national leader proposing uh, that the democracies uh, form a union. Uh, Ron, you can uh, add to this. It, it's my understanding you told me that that was what John McCain had proposed when he ran for president. He, at least he floated that idea for a while. Is that true? To some extent, yes. It's hard to know how serious he was, but mm. that's exactly what was at one point somewhat in the news. 
But the point is, is that he as a Republican did that. Yes. So maybe there are other Republicans who would at least be open to a union among democracies if they even if they weren't open to union among all nations. Yes. Hmm. Exactly right. Well, I'll throw myself back in the queue just as I froze again. Let me see if I could unfreeze my picture here. Um, okay. Oh, Ron. Okay. I see your hand. Let me, let's get you in. I just want to make a point about how lucky we were that the people created the United States. It was only because of certain outstanding individuals. I think Alexander Hamilton was the most important one of all. It was only because we had a few really enlightened people that the United States was able to come into being. And then we had our civil war. And it, that was difficult in a country. Think what it's going to be in the world. <laughs> Things change all the time. You got to get the right moment in order and the right people in order to succeed. And even when you succeed, it's not a permanent success. Right. Goes back to uh, Buddhism. It's all impermanent. <laughs> So I, I, I threw myself in the queue once again. I, I just wanted to um, highlight what I think Lynn brought up uh, earlier. I think that I think that was the point that she was making um, of that once there is a federation, if it if it doesn't if if the whole world doesn't sign on at once and only a subgroup does, that the thinking was that it would ideally expand by attraction, not coercion. You know that and and i think that's also the aa motto right we we don't coerce people to come to a meeting um they cut it's they come by attraction they realize that their suffering is so bad and these other people are 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 in a much better place let's go over there and join them so i think that's the same idea that this would expand by attraction not coercion and in some cases it might even mean that in the autocratic countries uh, that the people would overthrow their dictator, um, you know, because they want what's on the other side of the Berlin Wall. They don't want what's on their side of the Berlin Wall kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, so that, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I don't think there'd be a lot of argument uh, uh, to that. Other questions or comments? Yes, Simon, you just have to go off mute. Um, why is it that for so many years of writing and discussing a world federation, uh, we have not been successful? And the question I have is what kind of education and training should individuals have uh, by leaders like us uh, who uh, then prepare them what it means to be a member of a world federation. In other words, there are so many uh, difficulties, differences at present between the races, the colors, the genders, the countries, et cetera, et cetera, as we've been discussing for so many years. Um, what kind of preparation can we have which is uniform for everybody in the world, uh, 8 billion uh, peoples, uh, so that they all come to agree that this is the best thing we can achieve working together because now we are prepared uh, and agree with the leaders who want to form a world federation for the benefit of all and everybody without exception. Well, that, that, that's certainly one of the most important questions of our movement. So uh, I see Carla's, uh, Carla May's hand up. Why don't you take it from there? I, I, I want to re respond to Simon. I think you've hit the nail on the head. And I say, we need to take a clue from the marketing people. Repetitio, repetitio, repetitio. Get it out in front of people and hang it in front of them until they say, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, the 
Uh, the old saying from wisdom people is that you have to hear an idea seven times before it even makes an indent in your gray matter. And the first time you hear it, you say, oh, that's nonsense. The second time you hear it, you, you say that there it goes again. Third time you say, my goodness, I, uh, my goodness, they're, they're still talking about that. Then the fourth time you say, well, I'm, I'm going to look into that. And the fifth time it is, you know, uh, well, my goodness, there it is again. The sixth time is, you know, we should really, really study this. And the seventh time is, why haven't we done this all the while? So okay. my, my, my urging to us is get out in the public, find out ways to hang this in front of people three, four times a day. Good. Carla May, you have just been hired to run our marketing department. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Yamale. Yes, hello. I, I just want to piggyback off what Simon and what um, Carla said as well, because in a meeting with the um, Global Solutions meeting on Thursday, I was wondering how do we get global solutions out in the in the streamline? This is in the 1930s. However, we have so much social media. We have the ability to get this World Federation out there and why aren't we doing it? When I do present, and I'm still in the learning process because when I show this or our mission statement to people, it seems like it's not attracting them and I'm figuring out a way in order to persuade them. What do I do to persuade them to get them drawn in? And the people do I, that I do speak to, it seems like, oh, it's not doable. What can we do? Oh, it's not possible. So what Carla is saying, present it to them a number of times. And with the discussion that I did have with, um, with the staff on, on Thursday, I feel like it needs to be presented in a, on, a, on a university level to students in order to bring them in because it will get them to that seven, speaking to them seven times in order to draw them in. So if we could get in contact with professors, that's how we will, we will build this federation, um, federation. And I think it's important just to, uh, because we have the ability, but we're not just drawing in the people as we should. And just to piggyback what Simon said, I, I think he hit it on the, on the head and also <laughs> Carla, um, what do we do to just bring them in? And that's one of the ways that I suggest, but it's amazing that you bring it to the forefront because we do have the capability. Now let's do it. <laughs> right. Thank you, Yamali. Uh, Donna, and then David, then me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, David. I clicked on, I thought I was unmuting me and I clicked on David. Sorry. Um, there is a group uh, that just joined the World Federalist Movement as um, an associate organization. Well, it's pending approval by Congress, so things move slowly. But um, it's an organization called Atlas. You might have heard of them. And it's a, a group that has, has grown to 20,000 people in a very short time. Mm -hmm. And it is run mostly by young people. And uh, we are, uh, Drea is starting to work with them. Um, and also the WFM is starting to work with them and we're hoping to pick up on their ability to reach out to young people and get them engaged in the need for better global governance. So I, I, think, I think we need the young people to show us the way to reach the young people. And that's who we, we need to have. Um, I certainly also agree with Yamale that programs in, in universities, and I know Dre is working on a ambassador program with at Trinity University in a pilot basis. David might be able to tell us a little bit more about that. That's really exciting too. So. Great, thank you, Donna. Uh, David. Um, I just wanted to respond to something that I thought Simon said about getting everybody on board to agree, but a democratic world federation doesn't need to get everybody to agree. It just it's needs not. a majority whether it's a simple majority or a super majority, but you don't have to wait till everybody agrees on everything. Since it's democratic, it's just that the majority will rule the day. So um, it would seem hopeless if we say we, 
we can only have a World Federation if everybody agrees to it. Well, we don't have to get everybody, but we do need a lot of people. Great, thanks. Um, I'll get the other David in in front of me since I like David's today. So go ahead. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and this is response to Yanale and, and Donna. Um, yeah, working with Drea, uh, well, also on the World Citizen Club and reaching out to peace and justice studies professors and students. That's obviously a big part of the, the peace and justice studies outreach team. Uh, um, and that program has been both that that and the, the clubs have been slow to start, you know, partly due to the pandemic and just the ability to make these connections and get into those systems. I think, you know, having started the one club at George Mason University this year has been uh, a good um, eye opener. Uh, while we're also trying to get to American University and uh, George Washington University, and hopefully that will happen this coming semester. But in, with regard to Trinity, I'm so excited about that option. It's a unique situation where there's a professor who was, I think, involved in the uh, Norman Cousins uh, event, right? Yes. Yeah. Who, um, he, who? He was the author of the book. Oh, he was right. The author. Right. <laughs> right. So um, he said that the club, because of the uniqueness of that of Trinity, that school and the students who go there, that the club probably would not work because these are you know students who are in sort of an underprivileged or less privileged situation. And oftentimes they, after you know their classes, they have to go to work or take care of their family and other things. So a club would not really work in their situation. But if they could get credit and, and even like a, a, a learning certificate about World Federation and World Citizenship, that's the kind of program that we're creating at Trinity. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Drea's idea was to call it a World Citizens Initiative, uh, where the students would actually get some practical training in both in history and political science and other ways and could have a sort of a capstone project out of it um, that uh, would be useful for their education um, and then would be within the, you might say, the confines of uh, the work that they're doing in their classes and not have to be something that's extracurricular. Uh, so I'm so excited about this and it's really just starting. So I wish I, I need to know more. Dre and I have to talk about it uh, for us to figure out what the next steps are. But I know the speech that I gave at, um, at the, you know, in New York uh, at the uh, Week of World Parliament about uh, human rights and uh, identity or human rights and citizenship, that might be one part of the component of uh, you know, the teaching um, uh, that we'll be doing with these students. But, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, some of some of you in this, this uh, uh, book club today would also want to give perhaps a speech, you know, Ron, it could be about Esperanto and how that, you know, brings uh, the world together. Or, uh, you know, Donna, your, like your 20 minute presentation uh, about uh, World Federation and the, and the need for that. These are things that could be part of this uh, program at Trinity that we can then expand to other schools around the country where maybe a club is not the right approach, or in addition to a club, it could be both. So anyway, I'm 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 also for you know Yamale and, and Donna totally excited about this uh, coming up this semester. So anyway, thanks. <laughs> Great, thank you, David. Um, I'll just say that you know what we're talking about um, right now is is what my job is about. So I'm very interested. Um, so a, a few thoughts just in response to some of the things that were mentioned. Um, first, starting with Carla May's uh, Seeing Something Seven Times. Um, Carla May, I don't know if you know this, but actually the research says that as well. Um, that when I, when I was in college, I worked in a mail order department of a, of a store in uh, Greenwich Village, I went to NYU down there. And I read a book on mail order because I was you know, you're gonna, gonna be working in this department. And lo and behold, it said in the book that when you look through these catalogs and things, now it's on the internet, you need to see the same thing seven times, it said, that that, that, that was the magic number to get it in front of people seven times, uh, and then they'll buy it, you know? So I, I just wanted to, 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 to mention that, that, that that number stuck with me. Um, if you break that down, that obviously most people in the world still haven't even heard of this. So, so the first time, maybe the first and second time, is the initial awareness of bringing it to their mind. And then there's the, the kind of the long road of winning hearts and minds, you know? And it seems today what, what the real emphasis is on how you do that is by having a, a powerful story. 
to tell. So, um, so we, there, there are a number of them, oh, there I freeze again. Uh, there are a number of them that are used by various people. Um, you know, if you were on the uh, conference, uh, if you attended the conference and saw Saveda's presentation, um, it was a, a brilliant presentation of one particular storyline, starting with um, uh, you know the oneness of humanity, and then using the human body as a metaphor, and going on from there. Um, I tend to use a historical story. After World War II, there were a lot of people thinking about how to prevent World War III, and I kind of go at it historically. Other people go at it other ways, um, but we really need to refine that and really, you know, have have a variety of powerful stories that really work for people. Uh, as well as folks who come up with things spontaneously. So I, I think that that's very important. Um, and then to go to the majority issue, um, I don't remember what the number is, but I, I do remember some research or some speculation at least um, that actually you just need to get the cultural creatives in, in a society, whether that's 5%, 10% to really have a revolution in that society. Um, so I'm not sure if that would apply exactly, but you know there are always early adopters. So we don't have to get to everyone. We have to get to the early adopters and get the ball rolling. And the last thing <laughs> that I think Carla May also may have brought up uh, or, or someone else did about really being a marketing firm, that, that I, I really think we need to be a combination of you know, both kind of a, a, a Madison Avenue, high powered marketing firm and a university. So to be able to get the word out in powerful ways, but still have the intellectual rigor as, cause you know, the, 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 the professional, you know, in, you know, international relations people want, they're gonna jump on this and critique it. So we need to have that expertise, that level of, of coherence and, and strong arguments there too. So I think ultimately we need a kind of a combination of those two hats. So I, I see David Auden and then Simon. Go ahead, David. Um, in response to what Donna Yamale and David said, uh, to get young people interested in world citizenship and world federation, um, you could say, okay, read this book, read that book. But my, I doubt whether that would be very successful. But I think what would be more practical and successful is rather than say, read Ron Glossop's book, read Dave Auten's summary of Ron Glossop's book, which is uh, just a few pages long. Instead of reading Joe Schwartzberg's book, read Dave Auten's summary of Joe Schwartzberg's book. And all those summaries are on different websites that are can be available, either the Global Solutions website or the St. Louis uh, Global Solutions website. So right. I think that if you package it in three or four pages rather than 250 pages, you're more likely to succeed. Right. With an accompanying video and a pizza party. And then you got it. You got all the bases covered. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Simon. Uh, coming to the uh, question of uh, majority is enough. To form a world federation. Now, let's look at it. If 51 out of 100 are the majority and 49 opt out because they don't agree. Will that be a world federation? It has to be consensus. There should be consensus close to 100%. Like a person that is trained, let's say in a profession, it has to be a professional. We have to become professionals who are competent with character of integrity, who do the right thing, and the good thing, and by training, uh, we have to become professionals to form a world federation. And there is no such thing up till now. And that's why we don't have a world federation. We are just, you know, making useful discussions to get to a level where there is universal training in a professional manner where people do what's right, what's good, and they refuse to do what's wrong and what's bad. And they are also uh, competent in what they do. They do it professionally right. Whether it's a surgeon like I am, or a musician, 
who composes and plays at the same time, they are professionals. So we have to be training our youth and those who are older in ways to make them professionals who all want the same thing because it's to their benefit. And the current situation is not. Thank you. Okay. So, so you're advocating for a program of, of basically universal or global education for these principles and concepts. Great, thank yes, you. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Great. If we want to have a world which is global federation. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Lynn, see your hand up. I wanted to bring up the um, issue of the fracturing of rather, you know, as opposed to the melding of countries and the paradox now with the condition of Ukraine and Russia and that it's another proxy war, but this one's different because it's kind of more obvious maybe, or it maybe took a while for the United States to, or a lot of people to understand that it really is a proxy war um, than Afghanistan and, you know, Iraq and everything. And, and I think there's a level of confusion. Confusion th because people are divided more and more. And as, the, as more and more people get divided down, right down into their families, all the way up, there's more and more that you have to go against to get a world federation going, right? So how do you do that when you're talking about democracy? Like, because it's such a big word. And, you know, Russia might not be a democracy. China might not be a democracy. But what are they? And how can they be characterized and respected? Okay. Thank you. Well, um, we've got about five minutes left, but does anyone want to respond to the issues Lynn brought up? The Russia-Ukraine invasion, the greater division, both within countries and between some, the eroding democracy, you know, looking at all of that through uh, world federalist eyes, um, what does that bring up for people? How do we proceed in the light of the current reality or all of those current realities? Ah, gotcha. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you, you know, if you talk about it, you start to say Russia is you know, communism, well, communism is a big word too. And it's, you know, in China and it, and it's, the, and, and these are old words also, you know, there we've evolved into different paradigms that aren't so explicit. And naming something creates a, 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 a fight about it. Yeah, Ron. Yeah, Ron, see your hand up. I only want to say we have to realize social change is difficult. The people that formed the United States were lucky that they had a couple of people in the right places at the right time. Our movement to get the world united is going to be more complicated. It's going to take a long time. And we need to realize from the beginning, this is not something that can be done quickly. We have to get it started, but it's going to take time to get social change. Okay. Other thoughts, Yamale? Um, just to piggyback off what Ron said, and I believe Lynn was talking about, um, it, it's difficult to me when I hear a person when I, um, when just with my name, Yamale TFL, people have so many questions about my name when they see, when they see me. Theophilus, it's in the Bible, a friend of God. 
but they they say it a different name. So when people, I have to, I had to do research on my name to explain it to people. Just like when I ride the Metro today, I had a person, um, I had my card out and I was riding the Metro, well, this week, and the person happened to see my name and Yamale is French, but I don't know the complete meaning of Yamale, but I know it has something to do with water. But this is how I draw people into conversations, into conversa conversations. But today, um, this week, I met a man who is 60 years old who has never left the United States. And that's amazing to me because when I was in seventh grade, I saw the world map and I was showing people the island I was going to, Dominica. However, I noticed when people travel, and I, I'll be quick because I have stories to tell because of my travel. Um, seven year, in seventh grade, I was showing people where I was traveling, Dominica, but they're thinking it's the Dominican Republic. And I said, no, it's a country called Dominica. And I had to explain it to them where I was, where I was going. But people still don't know the country right now. But the divide within those countries and then coming to this country, they don't want to go back to Dominica. However, they come to the United States, they get all the benefits of the United States, and they put money in their country, but then their country does not want them as well. So I'm seeing them selling properties and such and things of that nature. But as he was saying, we are so lucky in the United States of America that we get to experience the different cultures and um, democracy, democracy, because we will never be completely democratic. And we understand that, but we have to just teach and explore and really, um, like I said, I'm learning throughout everything you guys are saying because if i'm just introduced to this organization i'm a little bit confused with what is a federation so i'm learning by hearing the discussion and it just has to be constant talk and constant discussion and just reading because we have the social media now but it's still not being addressed Thank oh, you. Fascinating. That's fascinating, Yamale. What you just said. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say we have time for one more comment. So, Lynn, do you want to <laughs> you want to have yeah. the last word? It's just it's so deep that someone would go to it, go come to the United States to get money for their family and then be rejected in their own country. Mm -hmm. That concept, that thought is just. I have to process that for a while. I see it right now in Nicaragua where my cousins are in Nicaragua and they don't, they can't be there anymore. They need to come back here. They came here to get a better life, but when they go back to Nicaragua, that's not the case. They're not welcome. But the so, interesting okay. thing about this is that we are, because we're in that position in the United States and we're new compared to the rest of the world, we have more opportunity yeah. to to break through our beneficence or whatever you call it, you know, to, to change the paradigm in federal, in, in a kind of a world federalism attempt. Yes. Okay, well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Um, I wanna <laughs> thank everyone for a different kind of presentation, or I should say a different kind of conversation uh, that we can have when we don't have a, a long presentation there. Uh, but this was definitely, um, you know, uh, definitely stimulating <laughs> for sure. So, um, so I'll turn it over. Uh, oh, and one thing I wanted to say, yeah, Bob, I forgot my first name, Lynn. Yes. It, it, it first I heard it meant a waterfall, and then I heard it meant the the pool at the bottom of of the waterfall but it means water basically and it's it's such a beautiful thought because water flows with everything you know and water's our most basic functional need so something about water and world federation is kind of ubiquitous
Well, hopefully we will flow into that as well, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so again, I, I want to at this time then um, turn the conversation over to Gail, who will remind us when the last session is uh, for this book. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, but before I do that, does anyone have any announcements uh, about either events that they're promoting, books that they've just written, or anything that um, you think we should, you know, think we should know about that's coming up on the schedule over the next month? David Gallup. I just want to say today is Human Rights Day, oh. December 10th, the 74th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So learn it, know it, live it. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> okay. Today. Great, great. Thank any, you. Other, said that. An, any other announcements? Who just said that, Bob? Uh, that was David Gallup who made that announcement. Thanks. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, in that case, Gail, you're on. Just want to remind you that the next session will be our last on this book. It will be the second Saturday of January, which is the, it fits the, the pattern. And um, hopefully Tiziana Stella will be able to join us. So we'll meet at the same time to accommodate her schedule, which is 2.30 to uh, 4 Eastern time. And we will be discussing chapters 11, 12, and 13. It's 46 pages to wrap up the book. Yes. And the book has a, a rather long appendix. So um, you are invited to read, read that as well, um, but we're not assigning that like in school, you know? So uh, we'll, co we'll cover the rest of the chapters, but the appendix is there as well. Uh, Lee, did you have an announcement? I, I re Please repeat the date of the next oh, meeting. Saturday, January 14, 2.30 to 4 Eastern time. Okay. Chapters 11, 12, and 13. Correct. Yes. Basically, the, the rest of the book. The re so you could either stop okay. after the chapters or you could read the appendix as well. You get okay. extra credit, extra credit for the appendix. <laughs> <laughs> An extra star uh, by your name. So um, anything else? Okay. With that, I, I want to thank everyone for um, your input in this conversation today. We'll see you next month. And if Gail, if you want to stick around for a 